let us first, oh, excuse me, a defense of compulsory labor. Let us first consider a quotation from Bossuet, tutor to the Dauphin in Court of Louis the Fourteenth. One of the things most strongly impressed, by whom, upon the minds of the Egyptians was patriotism. No one was permitted to be useless to the state. The law assigned to each one his work, which was handed down from father to son. No one was permitted to have two professions, nor could a person change from one job to another. But there was one task to which all were forced to conform, the study of the laws and of wisdom. Ignorance of religion and of the political reg regulations of the country was not excused under any circumstances. Moreover, each occupation was assigned, by whom? To a certain district among the good laws. One of the best was that everyone was trained by whom to obey them. As a result of this, Egypt was filled with wonderful inventions, and nothing was neglected that could make life easy and quiet. Thus, according to Bossuet, persons derive nothing from themselves. Patriotism, pro prosperity, inventions, husbandry, science, all of these are given to the people by the operation of the laws, the rulers. All that the people have to do this, have to do is to bow to leadership. A defense of paternal government. Mosway carries this idea out, uh, carries this idea of the state as the source of all progress, even so far as to defend the Egyptians against the charge that they rejected wrestling and music. He said, "How is that possible? These arts were invented by Trismegistus, who was alleged to have been chancellor to the Egyptian god Osiris." And again, among the Persians, Bosue claims that all comes from above. One of the first responsibilities of the prince was to encourage agriculture, just as there were offices established for the regulation of armies, just so were the offices for the direction of farm work. The Persian people were inspired with an overwhelming respect for royal authority. And according to Bosue, the Greek people, although exceedingly intelligent, had no sense of personal responsibility. Like dogs and horses, they themselves could not have invented the most simple games. The Greeks, naturally intelligent and courageous, had been early cultivated by the kings and settlers who had come from Egypt. From these Egyptian rulers, the Greek people had learned bodily exercises, foot races, and horse and chariot races, but the best thing that the Egyptians had taught the Greeks was to become docile and to permit themselves to be formed by the law for the public good. The idea of passive mankind. It cannot be disputed that these classical theories advanced by these latter-day teachers, writers, legislators, economists, and philosophers, held that everything came to the people from a source outside themselves. As another example, take Fen Fenelon, archbishop, author, and instructor to Duke of Burgundy. He was a witness to the power of Louis XIV. Thus, this, plus the fact that he was nurtured in the classical studies and the admiration of antiquity, naturally caused Fenelon to accept the idea that mankind should be passive, that the misfortunes and the prosperity, vices, and virtues of the people are caused by the external, external influence exercised upon them by the law and the legislators. Thus, in this utopia of Salentum, he puts men, with all their interests, faculties, desires, and possessions, under the absolute discretion of the legislator. Whatever the issue may be, persons do not decide it for themselves. The prince decides for them. The prince is depicted as the soul of this shapeless mass of people who form the nation. In the, prin in the prince... In the prince resides the thought, the foresight, all progress, and the principle of all organization. Thus, all responsibility rests with him. The whole of the tenth book of Fenelon's Telemachus provides this. I refer the reader to it and content myself with quoting at random from this celebrated work to which in every other respect I am the first to pay homage. Socialists ignore reason and facts. With the amazing credulity which is typical of the classicists, 
Fenelon ignores the authority of reason and facts when he attributes the general happiness of the Egyptians, not to their own wisdom, but to the wisdom of their kings. We could not turn our eyes to either shore without seeing rich towns and country estates, most agreeably located, fields never fallowed, covered with golden crops every year, meadows full of flocks, workers bending under the weight of the fruit which the earth lavished upon its cultivators, shepherds who made the echoes resound with the soft notes from their pipes and flutes. Happy, said Mentor, is the people governed by a wise king. Later Mentor desired that I observe the con contentment and abundance which covered all Egypt, where 22,000 cities could be counted. He admired the good police regulations and the cities the justice rendered in favor of the poor against the rich, the sound education of the children in obedience, labor, sobriety, and the love of the arts and letters, the exactness with which all religious ceremonies were performed, the unselfishness, the high regard for honor, the faithfulness to men, and the fear of the gods which every father taught his children. He never stopped admiring the prosperity of the country. Happy, said he, is the people ruled by a wise king in such a manner. Socialists want to regiment people. Fenelon's ideal on Crete is even more alluring. Mentor is made to say, All that you see in this wonderful island results from the laws of Minos. The education which you ordain for the children makes their bodies strong and robust. From the very beginning, one accustoms the children to a life of frugality and labor, because one assumes that all pleasures of the senses we can both body and mind. Thus, one allows them no pleasure except that of becoming invincible by virtue, and of acquiring glory. Here one punishes three vices that go unpunished among other people, ingratitude, hypocrisy, and greed. There is no need to punish persons for pomp and dissipation, for they are unknown in Crete. No costly furniture, no magnificent clothing, no delicious feasts, no gilded palaces are, are permitted. Thus does Mentor prepare his student to mold and manipulate, doubtless with the best of intentions, the people of Ithaca. And to convince the student of the wisdom of these ideas, Mentor recites him the example of Salentum. It is from this sort of philosophy that we receive our first political ideas. We are taught to treat persons such as an instructor in agriculture teaches farmers to prepare and tend the soil.